our discussant, um, Dr. Timia Spitka. Uh, she's a Sophie Davis postdoctoral fellow uh, in gender, peace, and conflict resolution at the Leonard Davis Institute for International Relations at Hebrew University. Um, she received her PhD from Ben Gurion University with a focus on conflict resolution and intervention in violent conflicts, and her master's from the University of Toronto in Russian and Eastern European studies. Her research is focused on conflict resolution, R2P, international mediation, group identity, gender and intervention in violent conflicts. Her book, International Intervention, Identity and Conflict Transformation, Bridges and Walls Between Groups, was published by Rootledge in September 2015. Dr. Spitka has taught classes in gender and international intervention in violent conflicts, international mediation, conflict resolution, and American foreign policies. She's also worked for several international organizations. So we're going to have about 10 minutes for comments, and then um, a few minutes for discussion uh, and questions, I think. Okay, okay so uh, really interesting talks from the panelists. Um, um, I think very insightful, and I think they flowed into each other quite, quite well, and, and also touched upon not only the, the larger issues, but also the, the human issues, which, which I really appreciate, as well as the gender issues. Um, so these are all aspects that um, and I'll try and sort of summarize some of, of my, my points um, from, from, I think, what were really, really um, excellent presentations. Really uh, great, I think, learning from all, all of us, for, for all of us. Um, First, for Dr. Berti um, spoke about some of the changing um, humanitarian realities, um, and and I guess um, I mean a couple of thoughts come to my mind. Not only her paper, but also the other ones. Is is is, is what exactly are we trying to do here? Um, and, and uh, where are the red lines? And, and, and is this another case of uh, a Band-Aid on a, a gun wound? Um, I mean, I, I guess, uh, you know, there's um, so much effort, I think, uh, in terms of also scholarly research uh, and practitioners' debates on refugees, on the humanitarian disaster, and so little on the causes and on the solutions. Um, and, and, and so I, I would like to ask is, is, is where are we, <laughs> particularly in the Syria case, uh, where is the tipping point? Um, um, so I mean, you know, I think in the past uh, we've reached some tipping points in, in some contexts, for example, Bosnia case where, um, which was mentioned um, also in another uh, talk, where there was, this, the refugee situation was so bad, um, and now we have one that's worse. The, the, the media exposure to what was happening, it was, it was the, the bodies were, were reading about it in the papers as we are seeing the pictures of the floating children and so on. Um, the, the fear of, of escalation from extremism and all that. Um, so, I mean, you, you reached a certain point where we went over the tipping mm -hmm. point, where the international community just simply said, okay, enough. Mm -hmm. we, we, we cannot take this anymore, and we're actually gonna try and work together towards finding a solution. And this is what exactly happened in terms of the Bosnia conflict. Uh, the content, we went from a, a neutral intervention to a partisan intervention, and the contact group came together and, and uh, sort of ended, um, yeah. Um, you know what, what was in fact not working um, the humanitarian intervention and what was not um, saving lives um, so so we have a very worrisome crisis um, and uh, and there's huge debates among both the the international community the practitioners and the politicians on, on this tipping point between a neutral and the partisan intervention, at, at which point um, should, should we, are, are we actually 
leading towards um, saying, uh, of using terms such as lack of responsibility to protect. Um, and uh, I mean, we, we, we know responsibility to protect comes into being in certain cases uh, of, of genocide, of ethnic cleansing, of war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Um, and I think we have all of these uh, in the Syrian case, uh, certainly. Um, so it's the question is at what point uh, we, we have the political will to, to, uh, to, to take things to a different level. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll move on. Because, uh, I'm sure everybody's hungry, <laughs> as I am. Um, so Dr. Salman, uh, re really interesting paper. Um, uh, uh, this is this is one of the presentations I actually had the opportunity to read the paper, um, so uh, so it's it's quite insightful. Um, I think, I, I, and I may make some scholarly suggestions for you because I presume that you're going to try and revise it and send it off somewhere. So so perhaps some of these things can be helpful to you. Um, so you, you you start off sort of saying what the goal of the article is describing peace. Peacekeeping missions, but I think perhaps you're trying to do much more than that um, as as a, as a goal, uh, and I think you need to clarify that from the outset, you know, from uh, from the very beginning. Um, and you're you're analyzing, changing on the role of um, peacekeeping missions, um, and also, I mean, you you bring out the responsibility to protect, and I think you you consider it fairly fundamental in the ways things have changed, um, but, but you don't bring that out at the beginning of the paper at all. So we, we all learn, learn about it sort of halfway through the article. So I'd suggest you, 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 you bring that out before. Um, and, and the whole question of, of, of moving towards a protection of civilians, um, you make a, a strong argument um, um, which uh, could become stronger, or uh, sometimes I'm not entirely convinced uh, that it's it's the progress is a linear one. You know, so sometimes I feel that the international community, in terms of its protection mechanism, is it's more of a pendulum, <laughs> sort of swings back and forth, depending on what happens. So, so it, it it's uh, uh, responsibly for to protect was a reaction to the inaction in in Bosnia, Rwanda, um, and then. Um, uh, to what happened in Srebrenica. And, and, and then after responsibility to protect, you had a lot of discussion on the norms, and, and of course you had the three pillars of the responsibility to protect. And pillar one is state has responsibility of the protection of uh, civilians. Pillar two, uh, international community assists the states uh, in, in, in helping that. And, and the pillar three uh, is, is, okay, when the state cannot or will not or is in the exact wording manifestly failing in its protection of civilians, uh, then the international community is responsible for this protection. Um, and the main debate is, of course, on pillar three. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I mean, and, and so, and you have a lot of reactions from uh, different states. Um, to pillar three, so and, and and you have abuse of pillar three also in some cases and a questionable use, let's say, of the Libya case of regime change, which is regime change is not supposed to be part of responsibility to protect. Um, uh, so, so, and uh, the, the cases that you mention, um, uh, you, you mentioned Congo a lot in your paper the Monosco mission and the rapid reaction uh, force. I, I would be a little bit careful, two minutes, oh goodness, uh, uh, about using it as, um, as something that is reflective, uh, just because, uh, I mean, the UN itself uh, says of this mission that it's, it's, it was done on an exceptional basis, and itself says it's not creating a precedent or any prejudice to the Greek principles of peacekeeping, da da da. So, um, um, yeah, uh, so in any case, I, I think, you know, you can, you can argue, well, oh, you know, the UN says one thing and the reality is something else, but I think you have to sort of address those, some of those points. And I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll continue because I, I only have very little time left. So, um, 
Thank you. Ma Maria Jamal, um, yeah, thank you so much for creating, uh, for, for doing this and, and, and for also such a positive um, uh, presentation. Um, uh, I mean, I think you, you point to some really fundamental issues uh, that, that I haven't heard about much in, in academia or anywhere else. Is, uh, you know, is there any effort to involve refugees in the resolution? A really, really important point. Um, and the whole human story um, is, 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 uh, is, is just such an important story, the psychological uh, aid uh, that's so necessary. Um, um, and, and also really trying to address the most vulnerable cases um, uh, and the importance of a intervention, early intervention, uh, in terms of the long-term uh, realities. Um, so, 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 so thank you for that. <laughs> so, um, it's nice to have some positive, <laughs> some humanity in, in this, and it also almost brought me to tears as well. <laughs> so, um, so uh, Dr. Stern, um, okay, this is, this is, of course, my topic, <laughs> um, and it's something that I'm also working on, and, and uh, you know, the, the layers, you, you bring out all of the complexities of the gender, um, uh, realities for, for women. Um, I, I, I would suggest, I mean, I mean, this is part of, uh, uh, it's very common in the international community to sort of look at this as bipolar men and women, but mm -hmm. I would also suggest that, that um, it, gender tends to be a rainbow of, of uh, you know, so, so part of the uh, vulnerabilities are also for, for, you know, people from other, uh, you know, minorities, other invisible minorities, gays, lesbians, transvestites, and so on, that, that similar kind of realities and vulnerability does, that go from, you know, also our layers and, and, and go, go back. Um, and then, you know, perhaps my last point here is, because I think I'm running out of time. Am I running out of time? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, is is just I mean, uh, is is there an evaluation um, in, in, for responses in terms of gender? I remember I, I was a gender um, uh, advisor in Oxfam, and I remember we had a you know for, to get funding uh, from Oxfam, you, have, you got a green, red, uh, or an orange light. So um, and it was a way of evaluating people's or NGOs. Uh, reflection of, of what the gender, their own gender lenses were. Um, I, I, is there such a thing? Uh, how have you evaluated uh, from, from your work, uh, the work of NGOs um, and humanitarian workers uh, from the point of view of gender lens? Is, is, there, is there any kind of categorizations at the moment that says, okay, these organizations are very gender ins sensitive and these organizations have just failed miserably, and, and um, is there a, a way of, of, of doing that? Um, I think uh, there's not one set evaluation. I think that, as you say, more and more donors are insisting on this piece, which is great. Um, these days, it's, it's almost unheard of to get a proposal, a humanitarian type um, proposal through without clearly pointing out the gender side and how this will look after the needs of men and women and, and separately. So that's really good. And with the, the donors demanding that, organizations are starting to paint that out more and more. Um, very much what I do for a living is that organizations will send me in to assess the gendered aspects of their programming or the gendered aspects of a situation. And as, as this is being demanded more in the industry, people are, doing, are sending in people like me more often. But certainly what is missing still to a large extent is um, organizations do, doing it within. Often there'll be a gender advisor, but I don't think that we're yet at a point where you can say that a, as a standard all programs are being evaluated from that perspective yet. But I think we are moving in that direction super slowly. Um, um, so I think maybe we'll take three questions and then four. <laughs> four. Um, thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much. So I will be very, very uh, brief about uh, Benedetto uh, lecture. So first of all, at the purely normative level, I mean, whether we can apply how to be on Syria, it's not an easy case because in Syria you have a failed state but you do have some signs of sovereignty so Syria would be a civil war a subjugation of a, an opposition and a playground for superpowers so 
So purely at the legal level, it's, it's a question whether R2P can be applied. But my main question, it's not at the normative level, but actually at the practical level. Um, can you tell us more about Arab relief agencies? And uh, about, I don't know if the Arab League of Nations is really active. Um, and the second question, I again, very briefly to Orly. Uh, first of all, it's very interesting how the community is reacting to you. Uh, I don't know if you are Arab speaker or not, but, but uh, so, so it's very interesting to be the observer and participant yes. simultaneously. And also, um, is there any activity among Arab feminists regarding the issues that you mentioned? Within Arab so, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're, we're going to take a few questions and then you'll be able to answer. Arab, okay. Arab feminists. I'm, yeah. yeah, thanks. Um, there was a question right here. Are they good? Thank you. It's also a um, question for uh, Oli. Uh, thank you for your presentation, and I think it's a follow-up and building up on what has been already uh, uh, mentioned. But um, you were talking about your work as a consultant and to assess all the gender, um, whether the programs have been you know, taken the right gendered approach. But isn't it um, just only a ticking box exercise? And I'm quite critical of the new public management approach applied in certain uh, international organizations, including uh, humanitarian aid as well. So how can you make sure that between the assessment and you know, uh, what is happening on the ground, there is a real implementation. Do we need to, to do more? What are the incentives for practitioners on the ground? And don't you think it's also a lack of knowledge amongst practitioners, just to get your views on that? Thank you. Oh, this is a really a terrible situation because it seems that everything is falling apart. I mean, there is not enough even to start anything. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I really uh, appreciate this issue that you bring the details about the differences because even what they do, they are starting from the wrong end and, and focusing on the wrong issues. So as you pointed out correctly, the strong fight and kill and the weak and ugly suffer and uh, starve and uh, be, are being abused. So let's try and, if you can put that, that's what I'm trying to say. There must be a way, especially since you come from America, that, uh, I mean, from United States. Uh, we, we no? None of us. Oh, okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> The, the, the Europe too. There are a lot of strong women, and if you explain to them that the, there are second-rate citizens, and it's regardless if they are Kurds or women or anything else, if all those beautiful people will come to the issue that they should see themselves as second-rate citizen. Thank you very much. We heard the very four, a very interesting four presentations, two on the micro level and two on the macro level. And I want to connect be between the two. Oli, you said that you were exposed to problems that are not connected to the conflict at all. And this brings, you know, we are exposed to inhumane treatment or what we perceive as as horrible situation human rights wise from our perspective which are not connected to the conflict at all and this raises a lot of questions of legitimacy of us westerns intervening in other societies which have different social norms and codes that are not elect connected at all to the extreme condition and this brings me to uh, benedetta who said you know we are witnessing in syria only an introduction to what we will be uh, witnessing uh, in the future and and my question to you is do you think that this new world order um, w which actually might be attributed to the end of the Cold War. Uh, we thought that the Cold War was a bad period uh, in which 
in some parts of the world, human rights were violated, but we, since the end of the Cold War, no hegemony in the world, uh, the fact that countries really don't want to intervene in other countries, the refugee issue or the mass migration issue is a result of ex ante lack of intervention. And if this is going to be the situation from now on, we don't have any kind of order in the world and different countries, different societies will enable themselves to, to revolt and to cause crises on the neighboring countries, okay, the discussion, the, the nature of discussion should change significantly. It's not a discussion about refugees, about migration. It is a discussion about the degree of sovereignty, autonomy, and the degree of the international community or other states intervening in, in other countries. And this is a whole totally different kind of, of debate and discussion. Thanks. So um, we, we're totally out of time, right? Um, no problem, because these are easy questions. <laughs> no, yeah, so no, one of the things is I kept saying, okay, which one are, are we gonna choose? The scope, the scale, the depth, um, because we know that the game is changing, and but it's changing at all these levels. And I think um, uh, what I was speaking about was this kind of shift in, in 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 the rules of the game of sovereignty. What is sovereignty? How do you how do you express it? How do you um, try and enforce anything that is that is determined by by those boundaries? And that's and that's where we're at with this. Um, did everybody wants two minutes to respond? Yeah. Um, I like the point that you raise about who, who are we to go in and, and change things. So in my experience of doing gender work in conflicts, often you're dealing with non-conflict issues. You go into a camp situation, you go into a displacement situation, and you find yourself dealing with harmful traditional practices, domestic violence. That's the reality of it. So in some ways, we are going in, swooping in in the conflict, and then telling people to change their ways because their ways are harmful. What gives us the right to say that? which links up very well to the other question that was asked, which is what do people think of you there? And it's a complicated answer because on the one hand, lots of people don't like it. Lots of men don't like it. It's very obvious that the men in a traditional context are not gonna like us foreigners coming in and telling them that the way that they're treating, the way that they've set up their families and their, li lively, their lifestyles are, is bad. Um, on the other hand, you know, women, sometimes appreciate it. You know, women find themselves in absolutely awful situations, both before the conflict and during the conflict and after the conflict. And in some ways, we are trying to shift that, so that's appreciated. But on the other hand, also, women are also part of these cultures. You go in there and th the women have bought into the culture as much as anybody else has. So if you go in and you say, you say your culture's bad, we're gonna change it, the women too are part of the culture. That, they also don't want to hear that. So how do people deal with me and what I do? There's really mixed feelings. Some people are very grateful. Some people have already bought into it. Some people think it's awful and that this is us imposing Western, um, Western norms in times of conflict and opportunistically using the moment of crisis to do that. And it's complicated. Quick response to that question over there about, is it just a ticking box? Yeah, maybe sometimes it is, but I'm not sure if that's bad. You know, yes, I wish it was more than just a ticking box, but given that it's not, ticking box is a big improvement of, of a no ticking box. At this point, the biggest incentive for, for people doing this often in integrating this work is the fact that donors are insisting it, and that's a good thing. If they do it for no other reason than that, it's a pity, but it's better than nothing. And it, the, the, it's good that it's increasingly happening, and it's a process. The more that we, it's, you know, people don't really understand the gendered side. The more that you get the message out and people understand how it actually affects, affects the effectiveness of programming, the more it will start to happen inherently. But it's a process and we're at the very, very baby stage of the process and we have to push it further. Thanks. Um, all right, so, so almost, almost, in, almost uh, very surprisingly, I'm also gonna talk about the ticking box, but maybe we're gonna disagree, which is very surprising to me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I also do, I, I don't do gender, but I don't do gender, but I do the, I work on uh, demobilization, DDR, SSR protection, and I sometimes also find myself ticking the boxes as the external consultant looking out what to do with rebel groups. Um, on the one hand, I agree with Orly that it's good that, certain, that, there is a, that there is an awareness. On the other hand, there is that fine line that I still don't know how to, um, how to cross myself between ticking box and fig leaf. And that's something that I think as 
I don't know, as consultant, as people that are practitioners on the ground, it really is on a case by case. For certain organizations, it's the learn, it's the beginning of a learning process. For others, it's really about getting the right funding mm -hmm. and paying you for a week and then sending you back home and hoping you never go back. So it really depends. Uh, there is no, I don't, I, I don't think there is a way to, to to sum it all up uh, as either or, but that's the, that's the danger. Fig, fig leaf is bad. Ticking box, if, if it's the beginning of something, then it's good, but it's not clear what is what. Mm. Um, on the R2P, I, 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 maybe I, because of the lack of time, I didn't go much more into the issue that I was addressing, which is not so much, I'm, I'm not so much about external intervention, so I'm not really to looking at the issues uh, related to R2P, but more on the practices of direct negotiation with the government and the fact that, again, in order to uh, to deliver basic humanitarian assistance in contexts like Syria, you are supposed to get the consent of the Syrian government. That is still the case. That is still the main assumption. Should it be the main assumption? Should we get uh, should we get to a more forceful redefinition of the rules? For example, going back to Operation Lifeline in Sudan model, in which one part of the country you work with the government, in the other part of the country you don't. You work through a UN agency like OCHA. That was the Sudan. I mean, Sudan was in the end disaster, but at least <laughs> there was a little bit getting getting beyond this 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 really big stumbling block of what do you do to get aid without needing to bypass Damascus. So that's more the the, the set of issues that I'm inter that I follow very closely more than the air to P aspect, which is a different one and not 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 as relevant to to me. Uh, the Syrian, uh, the, the Syrian Arab Crescent, uh, Crescent was the was the, the other question that is working. I suppose you were asking about what about local organizations. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the delivery of aid is done in modalities of remote management. So it's done through the through the local the main the, the Syrian uh, the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, which. Uh, opens the very same debate, meaning uh, to what extent can you call it a neutral humanitarian organization and to what extent you can call it an organization that has to work closely with the Syrian government and what are the dilemmas. So they are very much involved because they are the main provider in many cases, but it's not without dilemmas. Um, I think that's, uh, the, uh, yes, the, the macro question. To me, that's very relevant because I come into looking at all these dilemmas through the point of view of the changing war strategies and how and, how, and the the issue of I call the wars against civilians, in which uh, you see forced displacement by design, uh, starvation by design, use of sexual violence by design, and um, Ultimately, it does challenge a lot of the a lot of the assumptions we have for intervention and for what it means to do peacekeeping, stability, uh, and behind of that there is the other layer again to go back to the layers, which is the layer of how do you define sovereignty, and that's very that's very I think present for everybody who works on the field, which is who do you talk to, mm -hmm. uh, beyond uh, because and especially rebel groups, uh, subfections of rebel groups, local agencies, these are all unpacking this idea of sovereignty and statehood as belonging to the state, because in practice they don't. Put it in uh, one sentence. Uh, Can you speak to the mic, please? <coughs> Sorry. Put it in uh, one sentence. It's very simple. It's the Security Council political will to intervene. That's it. As long as the political issues are stronger than the humanitarian one, then we can see the political, uh, all of these political uh, aspects rule the Security Council. And in regard the MONUSCO that you mentioned before, it's, it's all right. I agree with you. This kind of mission launched because of the Russian and the, and the Chinese agreed to launch it. Um, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, Maria? <laughs> <laughs> I think every, everybody possibly is looking for your um, summary, um, if you have one. 
Um, well, uh, I would like just to add one point because I, since there were no uh, questions directed there to me directly, but I would like to add a point uh, to Orly's um, presentation. Um, we often face organizations coming to camps and trying to empower women, and this is a very, very fragile line between empowering women and considering culture as they do so because it's not relevant, it's strong, it's um, obscene to have empowerment for women and not dealing with the men as well. And, and when they do that without having the cultural backgrounds in their minds, we find uh, more violence, mm -hmm. more domestic violence, and more um, you know, extreme reactions by the men. So to do so, uh, and it's very important to do that, especially in the camps and in the severe situations, one have to um, bear in mind the cultural aspects, the cultural background, um, you know, how the family is shaped, what is the role of every member of the family as well. So that's very important too. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone.